لله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يقول الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل ألم يجعل كيدهم في تذليل وأرسل عليهم طيرا أبابيل ترميهم بحجارة من سجيل فجعلهم كعصف مأكول أما بعد In the name of Allah the ever merciful the most merciful the infinitely compassionate, the intimately loving. I bear witness to the oneness of Allah, to His magnificence, His omnipotence, His might, His glory, to His being the creator and sustainer of all things, the giver of life, the guider of hearts, the master of the day of judgment. And I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa azwajihi wa sallam is His final prophet, apostle, and messenger. May the peace and blessings be upon him, upon his family, upon his wives, our mothers, upon his companions, and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. May we be counted amongst them. First and foremost, we thank Allah and we praise Allah for allowing us to have gathered together on this day. Because we believe in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in the promise of paradise. And those that gather together to de in devotion and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a promise that He's given us. So, so we pray that Allah accepts from us this and that th He has filled this hall with angels because we believe in angels as well. And whenever the believers come uh, in devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels gather as well. I want to tell two stories today, inshallah. And they're most of us have not related these two stories together, but inshallah, after this khutbah, we can relate these two stories together. Inshallah, it'll be more profound. We've all heard these stories before, but inshallah, when they're put together, um, it'll add something to, to the stories. I started reciting by reciting Surah Al Fil. And Surah Fil is a profound surah in the Quran. Um, and it tells the story of when an army came to destroy the Kaaba, the house of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many of us know this story, but there are some historical context that we're missing. And so who, who was this army? Why were they coming to destroy the Kaaba? Where were they coming from? This army was led by a general, a king named Abraha. And Abraha was from Yemen. But actually, he wasn't from Yemen. He was from Abyssinia. What happened was that there was a, a king in Yemen that was very oppressive to the Christians. And we learn about this in Surah Al-Buruj. We hear about how this king was torturing the believers of this time, especially a boy. And he was, uh, they were, he was throwing them into fires and, and doing terrible things. And so the Christians who escaped from Yemen, they went to Abyssinia because the Abyssinians were Muslim. And we know this during the Seer of the Prophet as well. They went to uh, Abyssinia and they asked for help from the Christian rulers uh, because they were suffering uh, under tremendous oppression. And so in, from Abyssinia, there was a general named Abraha who came to Yemen and he dealt with this king and he uh, made it easier for the Christians to live. And he was a Christian king who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he built uh, a gigantic, a majestic cathedral. And he built this cathedral so people all over Arabia would come and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what does he see? He sees all of these pagans going and going to the Kaaba and worshiping these idols, doing tawaf around the Kaaba naked. And he's appalled, he's, he's hor horrified by this. And so he comes up with the idea that he's gonna go and destroy the Kaaba so that people can come to this, his cathedral and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of us, we, nowadays we watch superhero movies. They've become very commonplace and all our young people especially are watching superhero movies. One of the things what we've come to learn is that there's a difference between a hero and an anti-hero. And there's a difference between a villain and an anti-hero. A villain is someone who is pure evil. Their intentions are evil, their actions are evil, everything about them is evil. An anti-hero, on the other hand, is someone with good intentions. But he goes about that in a very evil and negative way. 
and it corrupts him and it, it makes him um, become a villain, essentially. And so the story of Abraha is, is very similar to that of an anti-hero. They say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Abraha, he was a, a believer. He believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's seeing all these polytheists and they're going to the Kaaba and they're worshipping idols. And so he takes it upon himself, I'm going to destroy the Kaaba, not realizing, not fully grasping that this is the house of Allah. And it doesn't matter what people do, it's still the house of Allah. So he goes with an army and this is where Surat al-Fil starts that this army goes to go destroy the Kaaba and it has elephants. The elephants imagine at this time are like F-16 planes or tanks. I mean, they're really his superior mil mil military might. So he goes to destroy the Kaaba and he goes with his army. And just a side note before we get into what really happens is that um, Abdul Muttalib was the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a beautiful story. When the, this army was approaching uh, Mecca, all the citizens evacuated Mecca to, to reach for safety and they knew that the city was going to be destroyed. Abdul Muttalib, he realized that he had some camels that were still there. And so he went, he actually went to the court of Abraha. He went to the tent of Abraha and he petitioned Abraha to spare him these camels. And Abraha is like shocked. He's like, I'm coming to destroy the Kaaba. Why aren't you petitioning me to save the Kaaba? You're petitioning me to save these camels. And Abdul Muttalib, he said that this house belongs to Allah. Allah will protect it. These camels belong to me. It's my responsibility to protect these camels. The Prophet he taught us that all of us are shepherds and we're all in charge of our flocks. All of us at some point in time, if not already, will be in responsible for something or a group of people or our families. And we have to realize that that responsibility is paramount. Some of us, sometimes we get very zealous. We think that we're going to defend Islam and defend the honor of the Prophet. And while we try to do that, we neglect our own responsibilities. What this lesson teaches us is that we have, we, inshallah, we will rise up to defend Islam, this religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will defend the Prophet sallallahu when his name is insulted and then taken uh, poorly. But more importantly, we have to make sure that we defend our prayers, we defend our fasting, we defend all of these things, and then inshallah those things will come. So that's one thing that we can learn. So this army approaches the Kaaba, and what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send to defend it? He sends birds. Birds are some of the weakest animals that you can imagine. And yet this, this uh, group of birds decimates the elephants, decimates this army. Um, and what this teaches us is that if Allah is in charge, if Allah plans something, nothing you can do can make it otherwise. Whether you have armies, whether you have superior military might, whether you have elephants or tanks or, or anything. I mean, none of that really matters if, if it's not the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to speak today about the story of Bilal radiallahu anhu. And you might be wondering why I preface this with the story of Abraha. But it's a really important um, thing that I think we often forget. Bilal radiallahu anhu, he was a, a slave in Makkah. He was an Abyssinian slave. And one of the things that this is a feature of the fact that the cultures that we grew up in is that we don't ask why was Bilal radiallahu anhu a slave. It's unfortunate. It's an it's, it's aspect of white supremacy. When we find out, we learn about Salman al-Farisi or we learn about Suhaib al-Rumi, these were also slaves. But we don't picture Persians as slaves or Byzantines as slaves or Romans as slaves. So we don't ask. We ask their origin story. We try to find out. And they have incredible stories and we should all go up and read up and learn ab about them. And they're they inspiring. But Bilal radiallahu anhu, he was also a slave and he has an origin story. Bilal radiallahu anhu, uh, Bilal ibn Rabah was the son of an Abyssinian princess named Hamama. And the reason the he was from Abyssinia is that when the armies of Abraha came, they brought with them other people. Usually when a conquering army comes, especially one that is almost ensured victory, they bring in the, behind them uh, women and children sometimes as well. So Hamama was an Abyssinian princess. And Imam Suyuti actually argues that she was the daughter of Abraha. And when the army got destroyed, some of it was still, uh, still there and all of, the, slave, uh, all of the, the people that were part of that army were sold into slavery. And so we learn uh, the story of Sumayya radiallahu anhu, the, uh, anha, the first martyr of Islam. One of the first, the first martyr of Islam. She was an Abyssinian. Baraka was an Abyssinian. Bilal radiallahu anhu is an Abyssinian. What's the, what's the story behind them? They were actually part of this conquering army that were sold into slavery or the children of this conquering army. So this is the background of Bilal radiallahu anhu. He comes from a Christian background. And the Christians at the time were, of course, as we know, uh, Muslims. 
So this is something we should be aware of. And it, it adds another dimension, another layer to, to this incredible story of Bilal Anhu. We know what happened, what he went through. When he was sold into slavery, he was noted for his intelligence and his strength. And so he was a prized slave amongst all the slaves. And he was in the house of who? He was in the house of Umayyah bin Khalaf, one of the greatest enemies of this religion, one of the greatest enemies of the Prophet, one of the greatest enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And think about it, subhanAllah, Allah put Bilal radiallahu anh, in the house of Umayyah bin Khalaf. He put um, Musa alayhi salam in the house of the Pharaoh. He put Imam Malcolm in America. Why did he do these things? Because these circumstances make great people. Great men and women, they're forged by difficult circumstances. So we shouldn't shy away. A lot of us will face difficulties in our lives. These are the opportunities. These are the watershed moments that allow us to uh, achieve greatness. What made Bilal radiallahu anhu so great? We know this story. He was in the house of Mumeya. When he heard about the Prophet, this is the first year that the Prophet received revelation. He heard about the Prophet. All he were, heard was uh, Allah is one. That's all he heard. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is his messenger. And just from that, he was like, I, I, he, he, he believed, immediately he believed. So he was one of the first people to accept Islam in a state of slavery, in a condition of slavery, in the house of one of the greatest enemies of the Prophet And they tortured him for months. Umayyah bin Khalaf would not let him go. He tortured him incessantly it, for months at a time until at some point he wanted to break Bilal radiallahu anhu, he wanted to make an example out of him. And we know the story that he was in the, uh, they put him in the desert, in the blazing sun, and they put a gigantic rock on top of him. And, they, they, and that was a means of his torture, to the point where he would pass out for hours at a time, and they would think that he might have died, but he'd wake up. We know he's a strong, we, he was a very strong man. He fought in the battles with the Prophet So, So he'd wake up, and this would keep happening, until at some point, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu pleaded with Umayyah bin Khalaf to, to sell, him, um, sell him Bilal radiallahu anhu so he could set him free. And um, even though he wanted to make an example, at some point he agreed. And so Abu Bakr asked him, uh, Umayya bin Khalaf, how much do you um, want for him? And Umayya bin Khalaf said, give me 10 dinars. And, and, and so Abu Bakr paid that price and, and you know, uh, bought Bilal al and set him free. Umayya bin Khalaf said, if you gave me one dinar, this slave is worthless to me. He means nothing to me. I would have given him to you. And Abu Bakr said, if, he, you, if you ask for 100 dinars, I would have given 100 dinars to you. Because what he is showing is that this Slave means something. He means he, he's priceless to me. And, and he was someone priceless. He was priceless to the Prophet ﷺ. He was beloved by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He was be beloved by Hazrat Omar radiallahu anhu. Hazrat Omar used to call Bilal radiallahu anhu Sayyiduna, our master, that was freed by our master, meaning Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So this is the story of Bilal radiallahu anhu. This is how he becomes Muslim, accepts Islam, and we know what, what happens after that. He is someone who is so close to the Prophet When the Adhan comes, the command to the, for the Adhan comes, um, he is the first person the Prophet makes the Mu'addin. And from that day on, he is the Mu'addin of the Prophet Every Fajr, he would go to the Prophet and ask him, uh, as Ya Rasulullah, like he's asking permission, uh, prayer, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet would give permission. He'd give the Adhan. Isha, same thing. So he'd see the Prophet first thing in the morning and at the end of the day. He was, he was like beloved to the Prophet I mean, he was very close to the Prophet And he's the first person to give the Adhan in our entire history, our sacred history. Then um, the next episode, amongst many episodes we know, is Fat Makkah. Fat Makkah is the day the Prophet enters Makkah after being oppressed, after being uh, exiled from his people, and he comes in victorious, but very humble. And they call Fat Makkah, they call it Yawmul Bilal. The reason they call it is the Arabs, they attribute um, great days to people who, who, uh, sh uh, who did something spectacular that day. They call Yawmul Badr, Yawmul Hamza. The Battle of Badr, they call the, the Day of Hamza, because of the bravery that he showed. They call the Battle of Ohad, Yawmul Talha, because Talha uh, defended the Prophet in very uh, dire circumstances. They call the Battle of Khandak Yawm Salman, Salman al Farisi, because he was the one who had the idea to dig the trench. So they attribute these great days. And subhanAllah, look at these companions Salman radiallahu anhu, Salman, uh, Salman al Farisi, Suhaib al Rumi, Bilal al Habashi. From the beginning of Islam, 
you have people from Persia, you have people from the Byzantine Empire, you have people from Abyssinia. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, after the Prophet passed away, where did he go? He went to China and established the first masjid in China. What this shows us that this religion from day one has been a cosmopolitan religion. It's not an Arab religion, it's not a Middle Eastern religion, it is a global religion. The da'wah is global and it's for everyone and for all peoples. So this is just a side note. But they call Fatmakkah Yawmul Bilal. Why do they call it Yawmul Bilal? Because when Prophet entered Mecca, he entered with Bilal radiallahu anhu. When they entered the Kaaba, he entered with Bilal radiallahu anhu. The Prophet destroyed all the idols. And the Quraysh expected this. They knew that they were defeated and they knew these idols would be destroyed. But what did the Prophet do after that? He had Bilal go up to the Kaaba and say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Give the Adhan. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. And the people of Quraysh, they were appalled. They were shocked. They, they were like, I I'm so glad my father was not alive to see this day. And why is that? A lot of us, we think, oh, it's because he's a slave and he's a black slave and they're racist. There, there was a tremendous tribalism there. But the reality of this is that what they see, when they, the year of the elephant happened, the year that the Prophet was born, actually, in this month, they, what they saw was the mushrikeen having defeated these Christians. The, they, they believed it was a victory over, over um, monotheism. And now they see the grandson, potentially the grandson, if not from the people of, the people that were defeated on that day, on the Kaaba saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, ashadu la ilaha illallah. So this is, the, this is the honor that Allah has given to Bilal radiallahu anhu. That he's the first person to give the adhan uh, in Medina. He's the first person to give the adhan in Mecca in this day. that They, they call it Yawm al-Bilal. And one of the things that Omar radiallahu anhu said years later, he asked Bilal radiallahu anhu, why, why was it when you were being tortured and beaten and oppressed and in such dire circumstances, all you were saying is Allah, Allah, ahadun, ahadun. And Bilal radiallahu anhu turned to Omar radiallahu anhu and he said, by Allah, if I knew anything else, I swear by Allah I would have said it. Bilal radiallahu did not know Ar-Rahman, he did not know Ar-Rahim, he did not know Al-Malik, Al-Qaddus, he knew nothing. All he knew is Allah is one, Allah exists, Allah is one, that's all he said. And subhanAllah, look at us. We have Islam, we have beautiful masajid, we have families, we have, we're born into Islam. Maybe for 15 centuries our families have been Muslim, if not less than that. Yet, we don't have the yaqeen that Bilal radiallahu had. This is what made the Sahaba the Sahaba. And this is who we're trying to aspire to and be like. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله ولكم السلام المسلمين. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم. When the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم passed away, it was um, it was a, a calamitous time for for the Sahaba. They were so heartbroken. Bilal radiallahu in particular, he just could not take it. Everywhere he went, he would spend so much time with the Prophet. So imagine someone that you love just disappearing. And, and he could not take it. Everywhere he walked in Medina would remind him of the Prophet And he told Abu Bakr radiallahu he couldn't give the adhan anymore. And he actually left Medina. And the Muslims at this time, they were expanding the, the rule of Islam. And so he actually went to Sham, the, what is modern day Syria, around that region. And the Sahaba didn't see him again for, for many, many years. And actually the first time many of them saw them was during the reign of Omar radiallahu anhu when the Muslim armies had gone to Jerusalem and taken back Jerusalem, Al-Quds, the, the Holy Land. And Omar radiallahu anhu actually asked Bilal radiallahu anhu to, to make the adhan on this momentous occasion. And so subhanAllah, Bilal radiallahu anhu, not only has he given adhan, the first person to give adhan in Mecca, the first person to give adhan in Medina, he's also the first person to give adhan in Al-Quds. So th these are the three holiest sites of Islam and Bilal al was honored to be the Mu'addin of all three of these sites. And imagine years, this is years after uh, people are seeing him for the first time. There's also one more instance where he gave the Adhan. He actually went back to Medina one more time to, to visit old friends and family. And when he was there, everyone was asking him to, to give the Adhan. And he, he couldn't do it. He, he just was telling them that, you know, I can't, I can't do this. I can't give the Adhan. And then he saw Hussein, Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhuma, the, the grandsons of the Prophet, the, the Sayyidah Shabab al-Jannah, the princes of the youth in paradise. And he grew up, he saw them grow up 
in front of him because he was so close with the Prophet And when he saw them and he, and he smelled their scent, he could smell the, the Prophet So when they asked him to give the Adhan, he finally agreed. And so he goes up to, to, to give the Adhan. And he says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The streets lit up. The, everyone, the city became came alive. This is the first time in years they're hearing Bilal al Ashadu Ashhadu la ilaha illallah. And everyone was asking, is the Prophet ﷺ, has he been revived? Abu Itha Rasulullah? Like, is he back? Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. They were, they, 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 this is how much they associated the voice of Bilal radiallahu anhu at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So they were asking, is the Prophet ﷺ back? And he said, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and he choked up. He could not complete the adhan. He choked up, he started crying. Everyone was crying. One of the, uh, the, the people narrating, uh, from this time said he never saw a day of weeping and crying like the day that Bilal went up to give the adhan. So this is how much the, the, the companions loved the Prophet and this is how much they associated with the voice of Bilal And this is something that it's hard for us to grasp but inshallah we, we can come to love the Prophet in the same way. One time during the time of the Prophet Bilal was giving the adhan and the Prophet was just looking at him, just completely silent, just, just staring at him. And when Bilal fell silent, when he finished the adhan, the Prophet turned to all of his companions and he said, anyone who says what Bilal recited will be guaranteed paradise. Meaning the shahada, shadu la ilaha illallah, shadu na Muhammad Rasulullah. So this is hope for us, inshallah, that we, we, inshallah, we say the shahada with absolute sincerity and that we will be amongst those people who will enter paradise because of it. The Prophet ﷺ told us that Bilal radiallahu anhu on the day of judgment, he will have a, a banner, a flag, a standard for having called the adhan. And one of the gates of paradise will be for him. And he'll enter the gate of paradise and all of the people who used to call adhan will, will enter behind him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us amongst those people that get to enter paradise behind Bilal radiallahu anhu, this incredible companion with an incredible story amongst all the other companions that even if we gave adhan once in our life or even if we just know the adhan that we enter paradise uh, behind Bilal radiallahu anhu. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid Allahumma barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama barik ta'ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hamni wal-hazan wa na'udhu bika min al-arzi wal-kasl wa na'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhul wa na'udhu bika min al-ghalabat al-dayni wa kahri rijal Allahumma ja'alna min al-muttaqeen Allahumma ja'alna min al Ya Allah, make us leaders amongst the righteous. Ya Allah, make us sincere in our practice and our belief. Ya Allah, have mercy on our parents and our grandparents and our ancestors, those of them who are righteous. Ya Allah, have mercy on our children and our grandchildren and our progeny, those, inshallah, make them amongst the righteous. Ya Allah, have mercy on our teachers and our scholars and those people that we have benefited from. Ya Allah, have mercy on our brothers and sisters in the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, bless the prophets and the families of the prophets and the companions of the prophets. Ya Allah, make us amongst that community, make us amongst those ummahs, and Ya Allah, have mercy on our brothers and sisters in humanity, all of them, those of them who are undergoing oppression, those are of them who are undergoing suffering, Ya Allah, relieve them of their oppression, relieve them of their suffering. Uh, ya Allah, have mercy on the people of, of this state who are uh, undergoing uh, calamities through fires, Ya Allah, make it easy on them. Ya Allah, make, make our du'as be an ease to, to them, and Ya Allah, facilitate them and, and make things easy on them. Thank you.